Thank you, Lakshmi. Hello, everyone. Trust you have been enjoying being a part of Clinical Conclave. Welcome to this session. I am Vivekanand Jairaj, Principal Product Management with Infosys Clinical, and I have the privilege of moderating this session. As the impact of the pandemic continues to disrupt business around the world, an increasing number of banks and global corporates are recognizing that digitization and commercialization of blockchain has led to increased efficiencies, cost reductions, and new avenues for new businesses and revenues. Now, some of the leading and progressive banks have started their blockchain journey in transforming their transaction banking business. And that is the topic for today. Today, uh, we have three senior leaders from the banking and financial services industry who are going to share live use cases a lot of practical examples, best practices and insights uh, that is based on their own uh, blockchain journeys. It is my pleasure to introduce you to the eminent panel that I've assembled for you. We have Emmanuel Gane, Senior Analyst and Blockchain Lead from WTO Switzerland. We have Shalini Warrior, Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer of Federal Bank India. We have Tim Tidwell, Senior Director and Global Head of Visa B2B Connect Partnerships from Visa Business Solutions. Panelists, thank you for making the time to participate in this live discussion. A couple of quick uh, housekeeping notes. I would request all listeners to keep asking their questions in the Q&A panel that you see in the bottom of your screen. The lines will be muted throughout this discussion. I would be collating and publishing your questions to this panel towards the end of the session in the QA section. Banks are grappling with multiple challenges today, be it changing customer expectations, evolving technology disruptions, the regulations, and new competitions. Now, the pandemic has forced banks to take a strong look at their current processes, businesses, tools, and adapt themselves. And they've been doing so with a lot of agility. From digital operations to remote ways of working to trying to automate the whole inter-organizational workflows via blockchain, there's so much changes that's happening in the world. We'll start this session with a question to all our panelists. Can you share the most important perspectives that banks have for blockchain adoption? I would like to start with you, Shalini, to share your views. Thank you very much, Vivek. And it's indeed a pleasure for me to be here at Finical Conclave. Uh, we have a long association with Infosys and um, it is um, you know, an association that has worked very well for the bank. Uh, just before I get into the question, let me kind of say a couple of sentences about federal banks so that it can set the context for what I'm going to talk about. Uh, for those not familiar, federal bank is a leading private sector bank in India with a presence across 1,250 odd branches uh, length and breadth of the country, offering the, a wide range of banking services for all customer segments. A um, couple of things that we're quite proud of, um, we were recently awarded by a very eminent jury, the Business Standard Banker of the Year um, for the year that just went by. Uh, we are a very significant player in the remittance business, so cross-border remittances into India, about 17%, 17.5% comes through federal bank. And that's one of the places where we've actually done some work with blockchain. We've actually got a live partnership with a, a partner of ours from the Middle East, where we process remittances through blockchain. But parking that aside for another time, uh, let me just come back to what you said. So I think the key considerations we keep in mind at least, and we have to remember the fact that blockchain is still an evolving technology when it comes to financial services. Yes, there are multiple use cases for things like cryptocurrencies, et cetera. But when it comes down to kind of banking transactions, the use cases are limited. Everybody's trying out things. Some of the key considerations that we need to keep in mind. The first is to truly deliver the benefits of blockchain. It's got to be multi-party. It's got to have multiple entities, sometimes competing entities coming onto the same platform, partners, suppliers, vendors competitors all coming onto the same platform. So that's the first thing that you know, we keep in mind when we look at blockchain. The second is, um, it's got 
the banks have to have the patience and the resilience to stay through the course. Um, sometimes, you know, we, uh, we see cloud can probably give you benefits overnight, but blockchain may not be built that way. There's still some more time before, you know, the, the true commercial benefits of blockchain can come. So that's the second consideration we have to keep in mind. And the third is the regulatory landscape is still evolving. There's so much still to be done by regulators and by partners like Infosys and uh, Federal and the others to work towards it. So if you take these three part, parts into account, the need for multiple parties, the need for resilience or staying the course and uh, having the ability and capacity to invest for that long term, as well as regulatory support. So taking all those into account, the right use cases that lend themselves and transaction banking is a very good example, is anything that is tending to be paper intensive, has too many parties involved in it, tends to be very, very fractured in its um, kind of steps. These attributes lend themselves very well to blockchain. And I think that's where transaction banking comes in. All of us know for a fact that transaction banking is highly paper intensive. There's a lot of literally, for lack of a better term, distrust between the parties in the chain. And therefore, this lends itself to be able to bring cost efficiencies, bring more trust into the system bring more uh, transparency between people and thereby reduce turnaround time and um, you know, make a difference to client experience. So that's really where I see transaction banking. And uh, to the point as to whether this is pandemic led or something, I think we all recognize the fact that pandemic has accelerated digitization. Digitization would anyway have happened, but clearly the last one year has shown us how it has been accelerated. So that's really what I would say as the setting the context for the question that you've given um, Vivek. I'm sure the other panelists will have a lot more to add to that. Thank you, Shalini, for your view. Tim, would you like to answer that, take that question up, please? A great question. I appreciate that. The one thing I think that transaction banks should be is open, open to ne new technology and open to the blockchain. If I look back a few years ago and I look at the internet and I look at how banks didn't embrace or they were real slow to embrace the internet there. I remember when bank statements online or were starting to come online and some corporate bankers were like, my client will never like, will never have bank statements online. They want the paper. They have accounting teams that will manage that today. And we're not going to disrupt that. Now, fast forward today, you get real-time information over the internet about the activity on your bank account. Equally, a few years ago, there was a journey and there was a debate on cloud-based computing. Should I have my applications in a cloud somewhere out there, or should I have them in my robust data center? But as we can see over the last few years with the advent of you know, cloud-based computing, it's really taken off and banks now with the security are trusting that new technology of the cloud-based. I would say, again, then with blockchain, the things that Visa is using it for, the cryptographic proof, the immutability within our Visa B2B Connect, or other things that are out there with blockchain, I recommend being open to that. Because just as the internet, just as cloud-based computing, I think blockchain is going to have a future with it. That's why Visa has partnered with Emphasis, a leader in this space, in order to help us integrate B2B Connect into their applications and to further that journey as we grow the blockchain experience for our clients. Thank you, Tim. Manu? Yes, hi, and thank you very much first for inviting me to, to be part of this uh, panel discussion. Now, Tim was just saying that banks need to be uh, to be open to the opportunities that a technology like blockchain can, can open. Now, from a blockchain and trade perspective, I, I see a sort of paradox. Uh, why? Well, as you know, 80% um, of international trade is financed by some form of financing. So trade finance is critical for international trade. And as Shalini said, it's uh, pro these are processes that are still very much paper, labor intensive. And so there was this feeling that somehow this world was lagging behind in terms of digitalization. But at the same time, and this is the paradox, is that if I look at the projects, DLT projects in trade, and I've been mapping them over the past few years to see the evolution, what I see is that banks were among the most active players and the early um, players in that area. We've seen, Shalini was talking about the importance of banks joining forces in consortia. We saw big consortia being uh, 
launched uh, fairly early on, uh, Marco Polo, uh, Voltron, that then turned and um, was transformed into, into Contour. Uh, you had a Widow Trade. So banks have been actually quite, quite active uh, looking at what the opportunities that this technology could, uh, could bring to facilitate um, the finance processes, be they related to letters of credit, supply chain financing, KYC, et cetera. Now, no doubt, the pandemic has accelerated the move. And um, well, we, we did see in the past some resistance to digitalization, as I was saying, in the, in the banking sector. And I was actually talking to, to a banker a few months ago who was telling me that they had been discussing the question of e-signatures for 18 months and we're going nowhere. And then the pandemic hit and they managed in three weeks what they hadn't managed to do in 18 months. So no doubt there has been a big acceleration in terms of digitalization. I think that people see the opportunities. Um, I think that uh, blockchain in that respect is, is very interesting. It's a technology that opens many opportunities to, to cut costs, to, to, make, uh, to allow people to interact on a peer-to-peer -peer basis and so to gain an efficiency when it comes to trade. Um, and I said we, we've been mapping uh, with the Trade Finance Global the different projects in the, in the trade and trade finance area. What we see is first an increasing number of projects the majority, almost of them, being in the financial sector, trade finance, supply chain finance, uh, open account, letters of credit. And what we see is that these projects have also matured. Um, we've uh, given a, a stage of maturity of these projects, um, and it moved from 2.3 on a scale of 5 to 3.3 uh, this year, or last year, I should say, 2020, because we published our last uh, study at the end of 2020. Uh, so great involvement i would see of uh, i would say of banks um and and great interest into what the technology can bring but as shalini was saying there are big challenges out there uh, so it's one thing to be interested but it's another thing to to make it happen and uh, well i'm sure we can come back to it but you mentioned for example the question of regulation which, which is uh, which is critical okay thanks Anna. that has been a uh, very different perspectives coming from all of you uh, thanks for sharing uh, I, would, I would like to move on to the next topic. Um, Indian banking blockchain infrastructure company, IB Big in short, is one of the industry's first blockchain-led initiative that is set to transform trade and supply chain finance in India. What we're going to have is have the entire ecosystem of this trade and supply chain into a single platform, which will give them a lot of synergy and make a lot of innovations out there. Shalini, as one of the earliest members of this consortium, can you share how this enhanced proposition on blockchain will benefit uh, the clients in terms of trade and supply chain finance? Um, we talked about how this has been accelerated by the pandemic, but what have been your reflections on this journey? Um, thanks. Clearly, um, this um, company, which um, we're really honored, privileged, and proud to be a member of, along with about 10, 11 other banks in the country, um, it's got large banks like State Bank of India, ICICI Bank, to smaller ones like South Indian Bank, etc. So clearly it's a coming together of a lot of good minds uh, to put to task this entire activity on blockchain. Uh, first of all, I think the guiding principles that have helped this company um, you know, get to where it is. Uh, it, it provides a framework um, by which not just banks, but third parties can come together and kind of experiment with, in a common platform. So there is a commonality of purpose amongst all of us. There is a meeting of minds and alignment amongst all of us to take this experiment forward. And multiples doing it is better than a single one. So if Federal wanted to do it by themselves, it would have been very difficult to mobilize the entire system. So that's the framework. Two, I think it gives greater voice to the discussions that can be held with regulators. The power of you know, collectively going to the regulators is very strong. And um, I think there's a lot lot more research that is going into it because all of us are in it together. So those are really some of the guiding principles. From a benefit standpoint, um, I mean, the topics chosen, trade finance and supply chain, uh, link back to what we said earlier, paper intensive, lots of parties in the chain, um, parties not kind of trusting each other to some extent, waiting to see a signed copy or something before they're willing to move that next paper ahead. So I think they lend themselves well. The benefits, um, one I think is just for the customer. I mean, the kind of time taken today to get um, you know, an LC through the process or a bank guarantee issued or goods cleared through a customs is huge. But with 
blockchain, we expect customer experience will be improved with lower turnaround time, reduce costs for the customer, and selfishly for the bank, it's going to be reduced costs for the bank also with margins being under such pressure, anything that can be done to reduce costs for the bank will be huge and risk. I mean, you know, there can be nothing better than the transparency that blockchain gives to be able to mitigate some of the risks inherent in transaction. So across the spectrum, it's you know, clearly going to give a lot of benefits, which is why this, this use case of trade finance and supply chain um, you know, have been, has been chosen by this consortium of uh, member banks who have come together. And we are quite excited about it, uh, looking forward to working with everybody to take it up to the next level. Thanks, Shalini. We are also excited to partner with uh, IBBIC uh, to take this journey forward. Tim, the next question is for you. The pandemic has accelerated uh, digitization across various industry segments, in particular, the payments industry as well. How is Visa B2B helping to transform the payments landscape for banks and their customers in this new digital age? Oh, great question. I appreciate that. Yeah, Visa, you know, with the pandemic, you know, I after 20 years in transaction banking, I still have a lot of friends in the industry. And what I found is a lot of their business contingency plans, a lot of the plans that they had best set for issues had fallen by the wayside. So a lot of banks now are focused on the business contingency aspect of rebuilding their banking infrastructure in this pandemic. What Visa's doing and what Visa's done is we've, we've looked at a small niche within the payment space that we can address and we can solve problems for. If you look at Visa traditionally on the retail side, we're in over 200 countries. We've, we're entrenched on helping create retail solutions for consumers and small businesses on that side. What Visa's now done is taken an, an approach to look at the problems that the wholesale or the transaction banking side of the bank has encountered for many years. So the clarity of the payment, the data richness, the time that it takes to get from money from A to B. We've addressed those issues with a new product that we have called Visa B2B Connect, where it allows clients to not have opaqueness in the information, but have clarity on also when that payment will be delivered. They can provide confidence to their customers, especially in this pandemic time, that the, the payment will be delivered the full amount and in a timely manner that's needed. And so those are things that Visa's taken, um, the learnings from the market, the pain points that are out there, and we've addressed those with the Visa B2B Connect Network. Emmanuel, the next question is for you. Banks worldwide are showing increased interest in deploying blockchains for multiple solutions be it trade finance, payments, KYC, and many more use cases. Now we do see, based on our discussions with a lot of banks, there are some impediments such as interoperability between different blockchain networks being a bottleneck for them for adoption. Uh, when it comes to consortium, there's also this issue of governance, right? There's a right set of governance standards that needs to be developed by all of the participants. Now, what I would like to ask you is, what role is WTO planning to play in these two contexts in terms of data standardizations so that we can have more networks talking to each other and smooth out this process for uh, adopting blockchain? Well, this is a critical question that you're asking, uh, and it's a complex one. Uh, you use the term interoperability. Now, interoperability is a bit of a catch-all term. Uh, it means different things for different people, and it has, more importantly, many different facets. Uh, so indeed, you're right, uh, we have a digital island problem, we have many different platforms um, that do not talk to each other for different reasons. Uh, one can be that they don't use the same technology. Um, another reason is that they have different governance models, so you may use the same, uh, the same consensus mechanism, but your platforms still won't talk to each other because you have a different way of storing the data um, and of validating the, 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 the transactions uh, and having them in the chain. So there, there are interoperability issues that are critical at different levels. So you have the technical one that I mentioned, and I mean, there's a lot of work being done on that front. But more importantly, I think when it comes to, to, to trade is the question of data models that apply end to end. Um, if we want, I mean, international trade transactions touches upon different ledgers. We talked about trade finance, but you also have provenance, you will have the customs. You, so all these ledgers, if you truly want to digitalize international trade, have 
to be connected. We, we need to make sure that it, these platforms talk to each other. And this is where data models and standards are, are critical. Another important aspect is regulation. And this is where the WTO comes in because the WTO is a rules-based organization. Uh, we work with governments, we work with trade officials, and this is where we can truly have a direct impact because you can have a great digital technology. If your legislation still does not recognize e-signatures and e-documents, you won't go very far. So there's a need to put in place an enabling regulatory environment, and this is where an organization like the WTO um, can, can help. Uh, but it's a member-driven organization, so our members, the governments, have to come to an agreement on these issues. What we offer is a forum for discussion on these issues to try and push them. Now, this is where we can have a direct impact. On standardization, which was your, your question, we have more of an indirect role. Uh, we do acknowledge that it's a critical part and that standardization is needed if we want to truly digitalize trade end to end. And so we not only keep a close eye on what's been what's happening in that area, but we also play an active role, in particular via the uh, ICCDSI, which is the Digital Standards Initiative, which is trying to do precisely that, to develop globally accepted standards by filling the gaps, because there are already a number of standards that exist. So the idea is not to reinvent the wheel. The idea is to try and map what currently exists and then fill the gaps and make sure that we can then have seamless exchanges from end to end. So this is, uh, these are the two facets of, of our work. Um, now it's time to take uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, I request the audience to share any additional questions through the chat panels. Um, this one looks very interesting. Um, with COVID-19 um, driving digitization in a big way, and we already talked about uh, KY, uh, KYCs, trade and payments. Shalini, would you like to talk about some other additional use cases that we can think of? Um, so I think you're right. The most prominent use cases that come in blockchain trade gets referred to very often. KYC gets referred to very often, but there are a couple of others that we can think of. One, I think, and this may be unique to India, I must admit, Vivek, is um, the whole process by which when you give a home loan, and you need to securitize the, uh, you need to kind of get the home secured to the bank. It's a very, it's a process fraught with a lot of paperwork and with a lot of risk inherent in it. So I think creating a blockchain capability of that kind, which links um, the registrars, the real estate owners, the uh, developers, something around that realm should help, I think, because we've seen a lot of frauds in this area. And, uh, you know, we believe with the federal bank that that could be an area that. Not going to be easy, but um, you know, clearly an area that could be looked at. The other is uh, credit, um, and uh, I mean credit in the context of um, not just uh, using the credit bureau, but can you get to a stage where alternate data sources are put onto a blockchain platform that people can access and therefore be entitled to credit uh, in a very different fashion from the traditional credit bureaus? Um, there, are, there are a few use cases coming out in the anti-money laundering space um, in other areas of fraud prevention. So yes, there are areas. But I think the point I'd like to say is it's less about the use cases. I'm sure we can find it. And it's less about the technical kind of um, you know, capability to deliver on it. I think the critical ingredients are what we spoke about. How do you get multiple players to speak a common language, um, you know, have a common, how do you incentivize all of them to have a common goal? Uh, because each of us could come in with differing priorities. How do you kind of converge all of us into a common goal? Uh, so it's less about the technology. It's really more about the operational issues uh, for success of blockchain. And I think, um, you know, with trade finance, if when trade finance becomes successful, others will follow very quickly thereafter. Thank you, Shalini, for that. Um, Emmanuel, I think you would like to take the next uh, question that I have here. Um, it says regulators are not keeping pace with new technologies. We have all heard about it. We have heard it multiple times over, right? Even with cloud, that was one of the key questions that keep on boiling it. Of course, it's a bottleneck for uh, blockchain adoption. What are the measures that can be taken to address this? Um, yes, I mean, uh, as, as we already uh, mentioned, um, regulation is, is critical. You need to have the right uh, regulation in place to promote development of and deployment of a technology like, like blockchain. It's critical that regulators keep 
in sync with what's happening with developments on the private sector side. So I think what, what is critical when it comes to regulation is really to, to have a public-private dialogue. We, we need the private sector to, to pass on a message to the regulators about what they need, how the regulators can help to, to make it happen, what are the type of measures that need to be put in place. So going beyond existing silos, really have this, this multi-stakeholder dialogue to try and push for the right outcome, um, to me is, is really, really critical at this stage. And it's starting to happen. It has taken time. We saw the private sector moving ahead at full speed on blockchain projects and the regulators sort of being in a wait and see attitude um, and not knowing exactly what to do. We now see much more dialogue and I think we need to see even more than that because the, the legal challenges are actually the number one challenges that companies face when they want to implement blockchain projects according to a survey that we did on um, focused on DLT projects in trade and, and trade finance. So I mean the message that I would give is talk to your regulators, tell them what you do, tell them what you need in terms of regulation, and let's have this dialogue and try to make it happen. Okay. Uh, the next question is uh, linked to this. Okay, it's a good question. Uh, blockchain initiatives are being done at a very geographic level rather than at the industry level. This has created so much fragmented networks that really can't talk to each other, right? And how do we create this flow, not only for a particular geography, but across the industry? It's a very interesting topic. Uh, Shalini, why don't you go first, and then I will come on to Emmanuel next. Thanks, Vivek. Um, very interesting question, and a dilemma that kind of, uh, you know, uh, CIOs and CXOs are facing continuously. I mean, are we doing blockchain for the sake of blockchain? I don't think we should, right? I mean, it's not uh, one of those things that you want to just do. So I think the way we look at it, Vivek, is um, probably uh, slightly different, I would think, you know, and that's where the role of uh, Aripik comes in. You know, we kind of part of this consortium working with other banks because we're clear that if we make this one use case of trade finance, one use case of supply chain successful, then I think it's got like a flywheel effect, right? Um, you know, one success will breed a lot more successes. People will have more confidence to go ahead. So to the question as to, um, yes, uh, currently they're fragmented, but coming together of these banks along with a partner like you guys in Infosys, uh, we do believe is a starting, um, is a very strong foundation that we're laying for greater successes. Um, the other thing I would like to remember is um, the, the for banks to be interested in blockchain, for them to be able to invest the required time, money, capital, everything, it's got to have business results. Um, I don't think we've got the luxury of, uh, yeah, we can experiment for some time, but it's got to have business results over a period of time. Yes, we've got to have the staying power, the capability to invest, but it's got to have the So choosing the right projects which have business viability, which um, have something for the customer that is discernible and uh, ability to deliver will help overcome this issue. Um, but I, I honestly think the way ahead is very bright um, in, uh, and I can speak particularly of the Indian banking industry. This coming together of minds has really made a difference for us. Thank you, Shalini. Manim, would you like to add some more thoughts? Yes. Um, so uh, I think we, we've come a very long way in that respect. Uh, I mean, blockchain has the power to break silos and Shalini was uh, referring to, um, to this consortia being formed. And it's true that it was a big step forward. We all of a sudden had a number of banks joining forces, working together in a co uh, competition spirit. So this is something that was fairly new a few years ago uh, to see that in very positive development. But when I look at the trade ecosystem, what do I see? I see projects in trade finance. I see projects in transportation logistics. I see projects in customs, but I don't see connections, bridges between these different silos. So we need to go one step further. We need to make sure that we have a cross industry approach, that we have a multi-stakeholder dialogue, that we talk, that we break the silos between these different industry approaches. Um, I think this is starting to happen. 
because people have realized that if you want to digitalize trade, well, it's great to digitalize trade finance, but it's only one part of international trade. As I said, you also have to bring in customs, you have to bring in a number of other players. And this is what we're trying to do with the, with the ICC in the context of the ICC Digital Standards Initiative is to bring all these players around the table and say, okay, now we need to break these silos. How do we make it happen? What do we need to do? We need to develop these standards. We need to work on regulations. We need to have common rule books. So it's starting to happen. I think people have realized that they need that in order also to capitalize on the benefits, on the opportunities that blockchain can, can open. Can, um, can open. But we're not there yet. Um, it's it will be um, somewhat of a long journey, I think. Um, but uh, I'm I'm optimistic, and I do think that we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. With that, we come to the end of what has been a very stimulating discussion. A very big thank you to each of the panelists that we have here, Shalini, Tim, Manuel, and a thank you to all the attendees uh, who have taken out the time to attend this session. I do hope this session was very useful to you. And there was a lot of takeaways uh, for you too. Uh, please do come back and view this recording. The team would send you an email containing the video links shortly. Please be free to share these links with your colleagues as well. I hope you'll stay tuned to Finical Conclave and enjoy the rich uh, set of speakers and sessions that we have lined up for you. Thank you. Goodbye. Stay safe.